Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm here with Dr. Aaron Rabinowitz. He's an adjunct professor in the Rutgers Philosophy Department and the Rutgers Honors College. He specializes in ethics, metaethics, and AI. His work focuses on developing a secular moral realism that is compatible with the problem of moral luck. He is also the host of two philosophy podcasts, Philosophers in Space and Embrace the Void. So, Aaron, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Um, and I should, technically speaking, clarify, I'm not actually a doctor. I have a master's. Um, oh. I'm going to be likely pursuing a doctor, uh, doctorate in the near future, but um, I am currently only master of Inuits. Okay, okay. Thank you for the clarification. No problem. Uh, you, you know, I, I, I'm used to have a lot of uh, university professors on the show. So I understand. I, it's I unusual for always... someone to be teaching with only a master's. So. Yeah, no problem. Okay, so I mean, the, I guess that the reason why we are doing this is because back in the summer, we had a short discussion on Twitter. I think it was on a Twitter feed by Bo Weingard or something like that. And mm -hmm. at a certain point, I think that I said something along the lines of, uh, okay, so after all this time and after all the conversations that I had with philosophers, particularly moral philosophers, I'm still not convinced that morality can be objective so but mm -hmm. since you're working basically on trying to create to develop a secular moral realism as i said in the introduction uh, then he, you you came uh, on the discussion and uh, said that uh, maybe we could have a conversation on my show to see if you could convince me or something like that so i mean uh, where should we start? Uh... Uh, well, of course, I'll start with the um, the usual caveat that like there is no um, magic spell argument that will necessarily convince someone of something that they substantially have desire or reason not to believe. Not not, not to say that you are uh, immune to reason or something like that. But I, I certainly I, I will put forward the reasons that I am convinced that moral realism is true, but I realize that some of them will be more or less satisfying to other individuals. So, mm -hmm. yeah, and I, I mean, maybe we could start by defining moral realism, or at least what moral realism is for you, since it is you participating in this discussion. So, could you tell us? Right. That? Right, that's another good caveat, right? Everything I say in here, there's a philosopher who's written a book disagreeing with it, and they're probably smarter than me, so um, take all of this with a grain of salt. But my understanding of moral realism is uh, there are some moral claims, some moral statements that are truth conditional, they can be true or false, and that they are objectively true. That, and we'll figure, well, like we can certainly talk about what we mean by objective here, but basically it's that there are at least some objective moral truths in the world. Not that all moral truths are necessarily objective, um, but that in, in, my, in my personal perspective, there are certain uh, defeasible foundational moral truths, um, claims that like compete against each other essentially, but are in a sense objectively true in that they apply to everyone. Mm -hmm. So I think that we already have two issues here. The first one okay. is how how we how we decide what is true and what is false, right? Because I mean, particularly sure. nowadays that we live in a world that is dominated by science, I guess that many times and particularly in an academic context, when we talk about uh, truth, uh, I guess that we are referring to something that can be empirically validated or confirmed or but maybe it's not the case here right so i think um that is a common conception that like things that are true objectively can also therefore be verified via some sort of scientific method mm -hmm. and i am doubtful of the idea that the kind of moral truths that i have in mind that you could build a machine that would confirm them in any kind of way like that. I do think that there are, um, 
experiences that people have, a posteriori experiences that do support my claims, my moral claims, but I don't think that they are testable in the scientific kind of way. But you're right, we have two problems, right? Because one is this problem of knowledge, right? How do we gain the knowledge about the moral truths? And how do we, and then the other would be, um, you know, what does it even mean for there to be these sorts of things as moral truths? And are they actually, could they actually be real, whether or not we can get knowledge of them? Because it might be the case that they are real, that they exist out there, but we can't gain any knowledge of them. That would be sad. I don't think that's the case, but it's possible at least. Mm -hmm. I think that we could even go lower here, because I, I mean, I guess that there's both an issue uh, of epistemology and an issue of metaphysics, because in a mm -hmm. way we are trying to discuss here if moral uh, if there are moral truths, right? I mean, if there are, uh, if morality is composed of statements that we, in some way, shape, or form, can decide that are uh, true, that correspond to something that exists, right? So, and that would be the metaphysical side of things. And then the epistemological one would be. If we, with our limitations, our probably mental limitations, are able to arrive at those truths, if we are able to uncover them, right? Right, exactly. And I'm, I would say, you know, as confident as a philosopher can be, I'm fairly confident that the truths are objective. I'm slightly less confident that we can gain you know, perfect or not, well, I'm, I'm certain we can't have perfect knowledge of them. We're going to continue to try to get better at understanding them. But like, I, I'm also at least somewhat confident that I think that we can gain access to them and that we can gain knowledge about them the way that we gain knowledge about, you know, mathematical truths and logical truths. Not exactly the same way, but in this, in the sense that like we have evolved to be able to gain that kind of knowledge. Um, so maybe maybe I should explain what I mean by objective because I think that's really important here. Yeah, uh, it, it was basically the question that I was going to ask you next. Yeah, good. Before that, I I, I have another follow up, but please go ahead. Yeah. Well, yeah. So I just want to because I think that some folks might hear objective and they might think of something sort of more oh, sorry more magical or something than I necessarily have in mind. So all I all I mean by objective is it's what we would call uh, stance independent or belief independent, which is to say the claim is true separate from whether it is um, uh, whether there is any individual sort of real or hypothetical who uh, affirms or believes in that particular claim. Okay, so for example, um, you know, two plus two equals four is true, even if no human being ever figured out the two plus two equals four, even if um, a perfectly uh, understanding being somehow failed to grasp that two plus two equals four, it would still equal four, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what that's what I mean by objective. So it's sort of mm -hmm. it's robustly true, independent of. Uh, real or imagined judgments of anyone with regard to its belief, God, human, or otherwise. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, would you be able to describe any method uh, for us to arrive at moral truths? Um, sure. So, Let's let's take an example, right? I'll, I'll give one of my foundational moral truths that I believe in. It seems to me all things being equal, and that part's very important, right? So all of these can be overwhelmed by other considerations, right? But all things being equal, one ought to uh, not cause unnecessary suffering, right? One ought to avoid causing unnecessary suffering. Now, there's a couple, obviously, very important words in there, like necessary and things. Um, and the way that we gain knowledge of that claim is a kind of, uh, in a, you know, an imperfect, a somewhat messy mix of our directly um, 
engaging with experiences of unnecessary suffering and sort of recognizing in them this feature of, for, for any lack of a better word, to be avoidedness. I think that suffering, and, and, and so uh, we notice that in it, and then we might ask of ourselves, is that just our personal preference towards unnecessary suffering, or is there something in the unnecessary suffering itself that justifies thinking that it's something that has to be avoidedness? And then we move, I think, towards more conceptual arguments about the nature of suffering. And it seems to me that suffering as a evaluatively thick concept can't really fully be understood without understanding that it's a, a mental state that should be avoided, right? That like should be reduced wherever possible. That's just, it is a negative valence state of being. Um, and in that sense, it... Um, by experiencing it ourselves directly, by perceiving that others are likely to be experiencing it, we can reasonably infer this moral truth that one ought to reduce unnecessary suffering. Mm -hmm. Okay, so basically that moral truth derives from the fact that we experience this kind of subjective negative thing that is suffering and that we extrapolate it to other people and we assume that other people also uh, go through those sorts of experiences and mm -hmm. if we don't like it then we should also avoid uh, doing things that cause suffering to others let, let me let me be let me just be careful there and say uh, you said you said if we don't like it right so, so that made it a conditional claim i'm saying it's unconditional i'm saying suffering has to be avoidedness built into it so even if i turned out to be the kind of individual who really likes being tortured for example mm -hmm. it would not then follow that it's fine for me to torture other people it's still objectively wrong for me to do that to them unless they want me to right unless they consent to it so again this is these are defeasible claims if somebody wants to suffer and you and, and it's in a way that is like you know, not sufficiently harmful that it's really bad to be allowing them to suffer in that kind of way. There could be cases where it's okay to allow suffering. And there, can, there are plenty of cases where suffering is necessary, right? Going to the doctor is necessary suffering in a lot of cases. So, and, and I, I also want to point out, um, you know, I, I turn to the unnecessary suffering as one of the early foundations to talk about because I think it's very intuitively graspable for a lot of people. But I believe that there are other foundations that aren't necessarily reliant on subjective experience in that kind of way. So I think, you know, all things being equal, we ought to promote uh, flourishing, all things being equal, we ought to respect autonomy, um, all things being equal, um, you know, I think there are certain things that may or may not potentially have intrinsic value that we ought to promote independent of any kind of instrumental consequences of those things. Yes, but I, I mean, you said that there are other things apart from uh, mental experiences like suffering that don't have at their basis a more uh, subjective quality to them, let's say, like autonomy, flourishing, and all of those examples that you gave. But, uh, I mean, isn't it always the case that when we're talking about ethics and morality, that there's always an element of preference to it in the sense that, uh, I, I mean, e even if you look at different approaches in ethics, like I, I mm -hmm. don't know, mm -hmm. ethics, utilitarian ethics, Rawlsian contractarianism, virtue ethics, and so on and so forth. I mean, isn't yeah. it, it, doesn't it seem that uh, all of them have good and bad points and then if people discuss among themselves then they agree or disagree with several different points of each of the ethical approaches there and i mean at the end of the day i'm not quite convinced that there's any approach or method out there that uh, that uh, approaches something resembling, for example, empirically validating one approach uh, mm -hmm. in, instead of all the others, let's say. So 
I am a realist, but I'm also a pluralist, and it's because I actually agree that it seems to me all of the ethical theories you just referenced all key into important foundational ethical truths, right? So the utilitarian identifies the need to maximize pleasure or to increase pleasure and to reduce suffering, yeah. right? <clears throat> the virtue theorist recognizes the need to promote flourishing, the deontologist, the need to respect autonomy, the social contract theorists, the need to uh, respect, um, I mean, the, the social contract theorists usually are one version of some of the other things I just described applied for from through a certain kind of method and we can talk about that more if you like um i you know i certainly think that if you're gonna if you're not gonna buy my moral realism some kind of social contract theory is going to be your next best option um but i don't think that social contract theory can really get off the ground without essentially covertly assuming well maybe maybe not hobbesian Ho hobbesian anti-realism maybe can still support social contract theory but uh rawlsian sort of liberal social contract theory as we all most of us think of it today sort of smuggles in assumed objective moral truths in its construction um but i do think what you're saying is essentially right in that i don't think there's going to be a unified field theory of ethics that's going to say here's how we weigh perfectly the need to respect autonomy versus reduce suffering. And there's, those things will often conflict. And when they conflict, there may be multiple acceptable ethical answers. And to me, the realism comes in and says, look, there are certain ranges of acceptable answers, right? It's okay to uh, put people in jail for, let's say, between five and ten years if they commit a really serious crime, just to give an example, right? Um, and there are certain, I think, objectively unacceptable answers, right? Like, it's unacceptable to just kill somebody for crossing the street wrong, right? Like, jaywalking should not lead to summary execution is a misbalancing of one foundation against another, essentially. So there can be lots of disagreement. There can be ranges of perspectives that are acceptable. But I also think there are objectively unacceptable ethical perspectives. Mm -hmm. Yes, but I, I mean, this is where things start to get tricky because, uh, yes. I mean, it seems to me that we are always talking about uh, for, for example, if someone from different ethical perspectives, uh, two different people from two different schools, let's say, are discussing, I mean, maybe one of them can find some logical inconsistencies in the arguments of the other. They might find that it is incoherent in some way or another. Uh, and I mean, at the end of the day, people can also say that maybe there are some moral truths that all people can agree with or something like that but i mean apart from those approaches uh, I, I really i'm really at, am quite convinced that most uh, many of the reasons why people tend to disagree is just because they have certain moral intuitions that they then that they then try to uh, post Oakley, let's say, justify in some way or another. I mean, some sort of mm -hmm. post-talk rationalization that I, I'm not saying that is not good enough in terms of knowledge, in terms of philosophical knowledge. But I mean, I, I, my idea is that that people uh, have preferences and then they create these very complex ethical systems derived from those preferences and and then if we go back to the objective side of things i mean that that's where i think it starts to crumble a little bit because then if it's based on preferences i mean i guess that you understand what i'm arriving at that at the end yeah. of the day it's subjective in a way or another yeah, I mean, this is the fundamental sort of Humean skeptical challenge, right? That, like, it seems like it, we gain most of our knowledge or a lot of our knowledge of moral truth through the feelings, the sentiments that arise in us as a result of observing individuals engaging in moral or immoral behavior. And we, um, you know, 
it is harder than let me see how to put this you know in a sense it is a harder problem than like proving and, and like proving that the earth is round for example right and and so so first of all right the moral realist can say uh, in a partners in crime argument kind of way that like look <laughs> the scientists can't even convince people that the earth isn't flat effectively right there's no argument that will force someone to believe that the earth um isn't flat right there's data that you can look at right there's there's science and math that you can look at that that i think is compelling but not everyone will find it compelling um so so the the convincing other people problem to me is the less scary problem because I don't have any problem with there being disagreement and intractable disagreement. Um, but I do think you're right that we, within our own selves, we should be very concerned that we're not just taking our own personal preferences and biases and talking ourselves into thinking that they are somehow objectively, ethically true, right? I do think that is a very serious concern. Um, I just think that, you know we have ways of avoiding it a little bit. We have ways of, of doing better or worse with regard to this, right? So on, on one on one way of interpreting the world, right, You if you were totally right, everyone's moral preferences would just be sort of their own. They'd be out on display. Everyone would just have their own preferences. There'd be no reason to really argue with them back and forth because they would just be um, these kind of preferences. But it does seem to me that even though we are relying on intuitions in a variety of ways, I don't think we can avoid relying on intuitions when we discuss ethics. Some folks try to, and I don't think it works. Um, not all intuitions are created equal. Like, I think people have this sort of very naive view of the use of intuitions where they think that, like, if I have an intuition, I have to treat it as infallible or something like that. But no, I mean, we can test our intuitions against a variety of thought experiments, hypotheticals. And I think that that, can get us closer to knowledge, to kinds of understanding. Um, it, it, again, won't be necessarily compelling to everyone, but I think, you know, for example, I think, you know, if I have the intuition that it's wrong to cause unnecessary suffering, and you have the intuition that it's great to cause unnecessary suffering, I think I have better examples and evidence on my side than you do, even though ultimately there will be no way that I could absolutely for sure convince you or anyone that that's the case. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one thing there that I disagree with. So when okay. you said at a certain point that uh, if it was the case that it was simply based on personal preferences, then uh, all people would have different personal preferences and it would be a waste of time trying to convince them to follow a different set of preferences or to adopt, let's say, a particular moral system. I mean, first of all, I guess that that's not really true because, uh, I mean, there are patterns in terms of people moral people's moral preferences and personality traits, like, for example, just talking about the work by Jonathan Hyde, I mean, there are the mm -hmm. five, six moral foundations. I mean, care, harm, fairness, loyalty to the group, respect for authority, purity slash sanctity and liberty. And mm -hmm. uh, they occur even cross-culturally and in different people within the same society. So I, I guess that, uh, I mean, I, I disagree with that bit and then let, let me clarify i wasn't trying to say that like there everyone would absolutely have total totally different oh, okay. ethical views i totally agree that like so so this is sort of a pushback on the on the problem of disagreement which is to say there really isn't as much ethical disagreement as folks like to make out a lot of the time there is a lot more overlap than there is disagreement um what i was saying is that if you genuinely take the anti-realist path on things it seems to me right if you really say you know, there's no fact of the matter about what anyone actually ought to do or ought not to do anyway. It's all entirely subjective. Then if I genuinely were the sort of Hannibal Lecter kind of individual who thinks that eating other people, you know, I, it looks like a fun time when I watch those movies. Like, if I really am on board with that, 
why would anyone try to tell me that that's not ethical for me? It seems like it would be if there's no fact of the matter and that's my personal preference. Mm -hmm. But isn't it a problem that different people and different societies uh, prefer different sets of uh, moral foundations? Like, for example, the fact that the conservatives attribute mm -hmm. equal value to the five moral foundations and the liberals prefer to put more weight on care slash harm and fairness and the libertarians practically only care about liberty and things like that. I mean, b because right. we are getting again here through moral foundations theory at the point that I brought up earlier in the conversation that is there that if Jonathan Hyde is correct and the metaphor of the elephant and the rider that comes from Hume as well is correct, then we have sort of a problem here when trying to arrive at uh, what we would call objective morality or not. Yeah, so I think, I don't think it's ultimately a problem for objective morality. I do think it's a challenge that we as social animals living with each other have to face, right? Like. Yeah. When I engage with conservatives, I need to play to the moral foundations that matter more to them if I'm going to attempt to persuade them or something like that. And same thing versus liberals. Um, but let's talk about this because I actually do teach Jonathan Haidt and I, I really like the descriptive side of what he does where he just does his actual science and shows that like there are differences in moral foundations between liberals and conservatives. I think he really goes astray though when he infers certain prescriptive claims from that fact. So Haidt um, sort of concludes that liberals have a defective moral palette, in a sense, it, because they do not properly value you know, uh, um, authority, loyalty, and purity the way that liberals do, right? So here we have a great example uh, sorry, of... Sorry, that conservatives do, right? You that conserva that conservatives do, right. Yeah. Right, excuse me, yes. So... Um, here we have it to me a really good example of two groups with competing ethical intuitions, right? The liberals feel very strongly that um, harm or, or care, you know, and, and fairness should be prioritized over the other three things. Conservatives lean more towards prioritizing them all fairly equally, for example, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and Haidt says, well, that's a defect of the liberals, it seems like. And I would argue that that's the wrong way to understand this disagreement. And this comes from Joshua Green's Moral Tribes book, um, where he pushes back and says, well, here's a better explanation. Um, harm or the prevention of harm and the care provided to individuals and the respect for fairness and justice, okay, those two things are ends in themselves, right? They are genuine moral foundations in the way that I was talking about or, uh, earlier, right? It's, it's important that you do those things. Whereas a, a respect for authority, loyalty to others, and um, purity are more means of to an end than ends in themselves, right? It's good to habituate yourself to be loyal and respect some kinds of authority and, you know, avoid certain kinds of dangerously putrescent things. Um, but you only do that for the sake of reducing harm and, and increasing fairness, okay? Um, and so he, from his view, the liberal has a more, what he says, refined moral palette because he re the liberal recognizes that um, what's really important are these two categories and the other things are mere means to an end and so should lose out in conflict against those. So for example, you know, if you have a purity disgust reaction against gay marriage, that needs to lose out to equality and the reduction of harm towards gay people who need to live their lives freely, for example. So that's, that's my way of saying as one case of, we have two competing intuition sets, but we have good reason to interpret that competition in such a way where one intuition I think actually is objectively better than the other intuition um, and that, that arguments can be raised to make that case. They won't necessarily be convincing to everyone, but I think you can raise the arguments. Mm -hmm. And of course I, I could give the conservative pushback, but you go ahead. 
Yeah, yeah, sure. There's uh, always another step in the argument. <laughs> yeah, of course. But, I mean, let me just ask you this, because if we are really talking about morality being primarily the result of people's uh, moral intuitions, in this case, the ones that derive from their moral foundations, and if we have that happening both at an individual and a societal level, um, I mean, let's say that they are they are the result of some sort of evolutionary processes, that these Absolutely. are basically systems that operate in our minds and that we've evolved. And because of individual variation, there are people that end up uh, giving more weight to some moral foundations than others and things like that. I mean, isn't it still a problem that we have evolved conflicting moral intuitions and then i mean if it is the case that the ethical systems that we create are based on those intuitions and as we talked about before you said that the intuitions are important and they are basically the foundation to those systems i mean isn't that a problem that we have conflicting moral intuitions so yes, this this evolutionary skeptical argument is a real problem, and it's actually what I did my master's thesis on, uh, Su Susan Street's version of this. Um, so here's what I'll say. We want to, again, go back to our distinction between what is true and what we can know, right? I don't think any, I don't think that the moral truth is dependent on our intuitions. The moral truth is objectively true. It just is. It's true in virtue of the nature of the universe in some kind, in, 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 in some sort of way. Um, it is a problem for our knowledge that we have to rely on these intuitions that we, you know, we have this mixed bag of intuitions that evolution provided for us. So, for example, you know, evolution habituated us to be very uh, in-group, out-groupy in our behavior, right? We're tribal creatures, and so we are, we lean person out, we, we lean behaviorally towards, um, you know, holding outsiders to a higher moral standard than insiders in just like nakedly inconsistent kinds of ways, right? Okay. Um, totally a problem, but I think it's a solvable problem in the same way that our, the fact that we evolved really bad personal understanding of statistics, right? Like to a person that you can, you can look at the studies and it's just like human beings are really bad at understanding risk and probability, right? But that doesn't mean that we as a species can't gain knowledge about the nature of risk and probability, right? Through doing research arguments, writing papers, refuting those papers, we can build up a, a body of knowledge about, you know, things like the three, the Monty Hall problem kind of stuff, right? Like where we can, we can really tell people, no, pick the other door like you absolutely should, even if you don't understand why, um, right? Even if it's so counterintuitive to you. Um, the same thing I think can be done with our moral knowledge, right? We start off with a mixed bag of moral knowledge, but through the use of re you know, reason, and I know that you have your, your concerns about the use of reason, and I, I think that, like, yes, reason is a social, you know, training tool, but it's also, I think, a method by which we can move towards knowledge slowly, sometimes a little bit, always in the shadow of the skeptical problems. Um, so I do think that... Uh, I do think that we can get around this problem. So let me give a concrete example. Uh, you know, human beings, let's say, evolved to be the kinds of species that would um, sexually assault other mates, right, for the sake of impregnating them because that's a reproductive strategy or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. um, so maybe that is part of the biological stuff that goes into you know, hypothetically men being more likely to commit sexual assault or something like that, right? I'm just giving sort of a very simplistic example. I'm not claiming that this is actually scientifically the way it works, but if that were the case, um, we can still, as a species, come together and grasp the idea of consent, right? We can understand the concept of consent. We can understand arguments for why violating consent causes harm to the individual whose consent is violated. All of that is perfectly comprehensible to our evolved brains. And we can be compelled by those kinds of arguments to change our culture so that 
sexual assault is no longer morally acceptable. So, you know, we did the same thing with slavery, right? And it, it involves civil war and it, like not everyone's going to come along for the ride. But I do think it's true that our moral knowledge has progressed over the course of human history, that we have gotten better about understanding why it is right or wrong to do certain things. So it's the, the, the famous quote, right, is, um, you know, we climb the ladder of evolution and then kick it away. Right. Like we, you know, our knowledge is based on this flawed, imperfect system, but it's a flawed, imperfect system where if enough of us get together and work on a project long enough, we can build rocket ships. Right. So I don't think it's an unavoidable. I don't think it's an unassailable or, or unsolvable problem, but it is a problem. Right. Mm -hmm. So but, but going back to that bit about the metaphysics versus the epistemology of morality, let's say. So le let's mm -hmm. assume that there really are moral truths out there. I mean, there are mm -hmm. moral truths instantiated in existence in the universe, something like that. And mm -hmm. then we have the issue of if we are able to arrive at them in some way or through some method, right? But, right. Uh, I mean, what would be, from a secular perspective, the sources of moral truths? Yeah, so I think we want to be careful in how we phrase that question, right? Okay. Because there's a similar concern that gets raised by theists Right, they'll ask, well, if the you know if the universe is based on um, physical laws, who wrote the laws, right? right? And the natural pushback from the atheist is nobody wrote them; they're just descriptions of the nature of the universe, right? You don't need a lawgiver to have a consistently behaving universe or something like that. Um, now, some might argue that moral truths are not mere descriptions of the universe, they're descriptions about how individuals ought to act, but I would frame them as, in a sense, descriptions of the universe. So I would say, you know, it is true, it is a fact of the matter that all things being equal, one ought not to cause unnecessary suffering. That that's, and so, you know, what what is that truth instantiated in? Maybe that's sort of closer to the question that you're concerned with. And then the answer is the nature of suffering, right? Just the facts of the matter of how suffering works for conscious beings or the facts of the matter of how autonomy or flourishing works. If you talk about one of the other different foundations, like it is the nature of these things that determines what you ought or ought not to do with regard to them. And that that sort of runs us right into maybe the discussion of the is ought kind of problem. But I do think that the is ought sort of fact value divide is resolvable in this kind of way by saying that there are sort of value rich descriptions of the universe that are essential for giving a complete description of the universe. And so in that sense, they kind of are both is and ought claims at the same time. Okay, so let's put suffering as a moral axiom or, or at the basis of our moral system in this case or the moral system that we are discussing here. Would, would there be any incoherence or any logical inconsistency if someone was to say, okay, so people in general suffer. I suffer, my family suffers, my community suffers people outside of my community suffer, but I don't care about the suffering of people outside of my community. I mean, Good. would that yeah. be in any way, from a philosophical perspective, wrong? Good, yeah, so I like to call this the Joker problem. It used to be the coherent Caligula problem, but I feel like it's better understood now as the Joker, right? There are some individuals in the world who just want to watch the world burn, right? And the question is, is there anything irrational about them just wanting to watch the world burn, right? That's sort of the question here. Yeah. And, and it seems to me, ultimately, the answer is no, right? So Kant, Immanuel Kant, tries really hard to make the answer be yes, to say that like um, there is something fundamental to rationality that requires that you be moral and that you follow the moral law and that it would be fundamentally irrational to follow the moral law. I don't think he can make the case. Um, and so ultimately what I think we're left saying is 
it, they're not irrational. I do think that they're failing to understand something. Okay, <laughs> it's not a pure logical inference though, or something like that. Like, there's no proof that I could show them that, like, if they were being, if they were rational individuals, it would convince them or something. Um, Nagel talks about this a lot, actually, and he talks about like, at the end of the day, what they're probably missing is just genuine concern for the well-being of others, and that there may be no substitute for the well-being of others. But th these individuals are, in a sense, another version of the flat earther problem. And that, like, bec merely because I can't convince this person not to act morally or that, that it's not in their personal uh, motivational set to act morally does not mean that the moral truths do not apply to them. It just means that they're damaged in a, in a substantial kind of way, right? If you think about a thoroughgoing sociopath, it's someone who has a low empathy disorder. They are... Unable to, uh, unable to understand the minds of others sufficiently to care about the well-being of the minds of others, right? That doesn't mean that, you know, moral truths no longer apply to Ted Bundy. It means that, like, he's broken. <laughs> and if we can't get through to him in some other kind of way, then we should just protect others from him because what he will do is objectively immoral. Mm -hmm. So, right, again, I think it is a problem for our world it's not a problem for moral realism. Moral realism, can st it can still be true that there are moral truths, even if certain individuals will never, ever, ever buy into them. Mm -hmm. But even if we don't go to the extreme version of that, that is the person mm -hmm. that just wants to see the world burn or something like that, I mean, is it philosophically incoherent for people to hold different sets of standards for their community and for other communities. Like, for example, let's say that I yeah. say that I only care uh, for the suffering or, or for the well-being of people that are part of my community. And when it comes to the rest of humanity, I mean, I don't care that much or I don't care at all. So one thing I want to note here, I think at this point we're shifting a little bit from meta ethics down into normative ethics, which is fine. Like it's totally fine to do that. But like I want to say uh, the debate that's going to be had about this normative claim is separable from whether moral realism is true or not. It seems to me that moral realism could be objectively true, you know, and then we have to figure out what the moral truth is about um, balancing of the well-being of, of local or personal or friends versus the well-being of strangers or something like that. Um, now, that being said, I'll give you my opinion. I think it's very complicated, right? I think that, like, ethics is immensely, immensely, immensely complicated, and there are often not very easy answers to these complex balancing questions. So, right, you have the one extreme utilitarian view where it's you absolutely cannot place any more value on the well-being of, you know... Uh, everyone's well-being counts for exactly one, right? So if it's a choice between saving five strangers or saving your mother, like you're ethically obligated to save the five strangers. I, I think that's an absurd position, right? I think that you absolutely are ethically obligated or, or that, that like you, you should become the kind of person who would save their mother rather than five strangers, um, right? So I think it's more nuanced. I think there is there are situations and ways in which it is okay to give preference to your in-group, whether that's your family, whether that's your community, over other groups, but there are unethical ways of doing that too. So there are limits to how much you can privilege your group over another group. And that ultimately the ethical goal, I think, should be to view it all as one fairly large group and try to incorporate everyone into that group as much as is possible. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to the metaethics okay. and, and talk again about the issue of metaphysics, let's say. So, I mean, you say that moral truths are instantiated in the universe, in existence. So, mm -hmm. uh, and if we look at science, for example, we have the laws of physics. Uh -huh. uh, so, but, but, I mean, it seems to me that these two these two different things are fundamentally different in the sense that so people discovered the laws of physics that is for example how bodies interact with one another at distance and 
mm-hmm. things like that. Uh, but the, the, this is about describing what happens in the universe. It's, mm-hmm. not, it's not about making a value judgment about if those things that we are describing are good or bad. I mean, it, 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 for me, at least, it wouldn't even make sense to say that the laws of physics are good or bad. I mean, they are what they are. People might have described them uh, uh, wrongly in some way, and maybe in the future someone will come up with a better explanation, but that's basically mm-hmm. it. So, I mean, isn't there a very fundamental difference between a factual judgment, let's say, and the value judgment. So, on one level, I do want to agree with you. I do think it is the case that there is... And and so, I guess I want to reframe it a little bit and say there's a difference between value-neutral facts and value-laden facts. Okay. Right? So rather than uh, accept the split in such a way where it assumes the claim that the universe is value neutral in this kind of way, I think I instead want to push back and say, you know, the universe contains both value laden facts and value neutral facts. And they are very different things and behave in different kinds of ways to some extent, it seems like. Um, But that doesn't mean that they can't coexist any more than like, you know, I think that there are quote unquote physical facts and mental facts, right? There are facts about your mental states, but what your mental states are is a really weird question, right? You have the hard problem of consciousness. That being said, I think there is some way to reconcile that. And so it's okay to have um, factual claims about systems that supervene on the physical world, but are not reducible to the physical facts, or, or, or what we'll call the, the non-evaluative facts in some kind of way. Mm-hmm. Um, but so, I agree with you that they are, they are different in that kind of sense, yeah. Mm-hmm. So let me put forth another challenge now. So, okay. I mean, we know that the reason why we have morality is basically because we evolved a set of cognitive tools that we use to produce uh, morality. In this case, uh, I mean, we have, for example, uh, social emotions, and that's the reason why we care the way Mm -hmm. by which we deal with other people, the kind of relationships that we establish, uh, if we harm other people or if we treat them well, uh, and so on and so forth. So, mm-hmm. I mean, because this, this has been the result of an evolutionary process, let's say that for some reason or another, we, have, we had evolved in a different way because we were exposed to different selective pressures. Then mm-hmm. we would certainly have at our disposal another set of cognitive tools that are at the basis of morality. So, I mean, it's not hard for me to imagine that a chimpanzee, their moral system or their morality would be described in another way or would work in another way. They have morality, but it's different from our morality or the kinds of moral systems that we are able to develop. So, uh, Mm -hmm. so, uh, I mean, at the end of the day, wouldn't it still be a problem that the fact that the way by which we are able to evaluate moral truths is fundamentally dependent on the random or uh, uh, not arbitrary, arbitrary, but random way that we evolved? So this is a kind of sort of evolutionary luck problem, it seems to me, right? Like, you know, if my view is um, being a compassionate individual is essential to being ethical, right? And we had evolved to be solitary beings that had no compassion for anyone else because it wasn't adaptive to do so, right? Would that then mean that uh, that undermined the claim that there is any objective value in being compassionate, right? Is that sort of the, the concern? Mm-hmm. Or, or maybe more the concern here would be that, uh, the, I mean, let me try to put it in another way. Let's say uh-huh. that there are 
moral truths out there. Okay, so yeah. le let's assume that, at, at, okay. at, le at least just for the sake of the argument. But we are limited in the sense that we can only uh, arrive at them via our cognitive apparatus that is limited, of course. So, sure. I, I mean, at the end of the day, wouldn't it always be the case that the moral systems that we would be able to develop would always fall short from the moral truths that are instantiated in the universe? I don't think it would be necessarily the case. I do think we would. there's a high risk that it can go that way. Um, but it's sort of the same way of saying, you know, if we'd evolved differently, we never would have developed physics. And so we never would have developed any understanding of physics or something like that. Like, it's possible, but it doesn't change the objective nature of physics. It's just, it gives us good reason to be very thankful that we were not made a different way in this kind of sense. Now, I mean, there is another question here of like, if we were constituted very, very differently in some kind of way, would morality apply to us differently? And there, yeah, I think the moral realist can say, you know, moral truths are context sensitive and relative to the organisms in a, in a certain kind of way while still being objective. So Aristotle makes this point that like, um, there can be objective claims that are relative to individuals. He uses the example of Milo the wrestler and eating and like, you know, how much Milo should eat versus how much I should eat is objective, but it's relative to our particular constitutions, right? So, you know, if we imagine that there was a being, um, just to make things simple, right, that like derived immense pleasure <laughs> from just unnecessary suffering in some kind of way, right? Just setting aside whether that's even conceptually possible, right? It might then not be the case that we need to concern ourselves with the moral foundation of reducing their unnecessary suffering. But it would still be true for them that they ought to reduce the unnecessary suffering of beings who are not constituted that way. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I do think that like, I, I'm a big proponent of moral luck. And so I think that, you know, uh, luck determines everything really all the way down. And so if, you're, if your concern is, you know, if we just came up with the moral understanding because of luck, isn't that a major problem? My response is, I absolutely agree that we came up with it because of luck, and I'm hoping that there's a way around that problem. But like, I hope that I, I do. I do think that um, because we got lucky, in a sense, we are able to bootstrap our way up from that to better understanding. Now, it'll never be perfect, just like our, our scientific understanding will never be perfect because it's limited by this first-person perspective, limited by you know what bands of things we can see and stuff like that like um you know if our um perceptual apparatus had been constituted very differently maybe we would have had very different kinds of science or something like that but it doesn't change the fact that we are um discovering more and more accurate models of how to conceptualize this universe mm -hmm. so i mean could we establish uh, some sort of parallel between uh, the way you think about moral truths and the truths that science is able to uncover? Because I was just thinking that when it comes to science, I think that it's also the case that the only reason why we take the knowledge that scientists produce seriously is ultimately based on the fact that we accept the, the epistemological assumptions behind the scientific method in the sense that we believe that by having that sort of empirical method, the results that we get from it, the conclusions that we arrive at, are really describing reality or correspond to something real. I mean, if someone simply decides to not believe in those uh, empirical <laughs> empir or uh, epistemological assumptions of science, then that person could simply completely reject the entire uh, edifice of uh, scientific knowledge, right? Um, 
I mean, they could mouth those words. I feel like I, I am doubtful of whether they would necessarily be able to fully reject belief in a re- consistent, reliable, you know, a, 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 the kind of consistent universe that is the sort of fundamental assumption of science, which is that we are observing some set of entities that have consistent behavior. Otherwise, predicting that behavior would just be utterly pointless, right? Now, I mean... The reason I believe that science works is because the rockets go up. Like, right, right? my inference is far less sort of impressively has to do with the the nature of the underlying assumptions or the epistemic, you know, like the empiricism behind it. Like, I get why it works and I value it because it works in that way. But like, the ultimately the reason I'm convinced is because the rockets go up. And right, if if you know if you pray for the rocket to go up, it doesn't go anywhere. So, yeah, but, but that's when people when critics say, for example, that that's an inductivist approach, right? Yeah, I mean, I like, you know, I'm, I love Sextus Empiricus, and I'm on board for radical skepticism whenever anyone wants to pull the, like, radical skepticism zip cord, but, like, as long as we're being realists about anything, right, as long as we're having realist beliefs about the nature of anything in the universe, I think that moral realism should go in the bag along with are other kinds of realism. Um, let me give you a hypothetical, right? And again, I realize this won't necessarily be compelling, but this is this is the argument that ultimately does it for me, okay? Yeah. Um, and it's a form of a reductio ad absurdum, so your mileage may vary. Um, all right, imagine if we got together everyone in the universe, okay, all the conscious beings, and we held a big vote, social contract theory style, right? And we voted that it was okay to torture lesser animals or something, right? It's okay to torture pigs, okay to torture dogs. Anyone who seems less um, psychologically developed than you is fair game for torture, okay? And like those folks, they don't get a vote or something because they're just animals or something, right? But uh, all these other people, right? Anyone who could comprehend the vote gets a vote and they all vote yay, right? And they make it the case that it's okay to do this thing. Do you personally feel that that vote has any impact on the moral nature of, you know, factory farming, torturing animals for fun, uh, that kind of thing? Or do you feel that it remains immoral in spite of that vote? What is your intuitions about that? Uh, I, I mean, could, could you just repeat the, the scenario there? Because I missed a bit. Sure. Sorry. Yeah, no, so, um, you know, imagine everyone comes together and holds a vote about the ethical nature of torturing lesser animals. And they all come together and they all vote and say it's now moral to torture lesser animals. Do you believe that that vote has any impact on the moral nature of torturing lesser animals? Uh, if it was the case that all people agreed with that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess that my answer depends on the fact that I'm not a moral realist. And so uh, from my from my standpoint, I would say that uh, it, it has some weight on us deciding that it really uh, says something about the moral truth behind uh, animal suffering, let's say, and that we should avoid uh, harming other animals unnecessarily. Uh, mm-hmm. So, uh, b- because I think that, uh, mm-hmm. I mean, so uh, j- just to go back to the moral intuitions, we have okay. moral intuitions, and then we build up our moral systems based on those moral intuitions, and then uh, uh, people at the societal level decide to share those moral systems uh, also because it is practically useful to share the same moral system because it allows for you to predict other people's behavior better than than simply not having any of those kinds of things in common so i i, I mean for me from a moral relativistic perspective uh, yeah. Yes, I, yes, I would take seriously the fact that all people, even if it was only within a given society, would have agreed on a particular um, moral truth or something like that. Yeah. 
Great. I appreciate you being earnest about biting the bullet on that one. Um, uh, and I have other philosophers who will say, yeah, it would change things. And to me, right, and again, we're talking about competing intuitions here, that strikes me as a reductio ad absurdum of the relativist view, that it's it would be absurd to say that that vote had any impact on whether it was okay for me to actually start torturing small animals in some kind of way. That like, and, and, and let me unpack why a little bit, right? It's not mere intuition. It's because of the nature of suffering that it is wrong to torture small animals, right? It's not because we decided that it's wrong. It's because it causes suffering to that animal and the nature of that suffering carries with it certain moral weight. And that weight is totally separate from our beliefs about the levels of the weight of that suffering. So it seems to me that like a vote like that isn't even in the ballpark of the causes of moral truth or falsity. It's totally mis mis misunderstanding what is the source of normativity in that kind of way. Um, and it seems like there are serious practical implications for biting that bullet, right? Like separate from that conceptual argument, there's the fact that it means that you have to bite the bullet and say, you know, the Nazis weren't wrong for being Nazis and like societies that allow child brides aren't wrong for marrying off 12 year olds and something like that. Right. And I think that that's, again, a reductio ad absurdum. Right. You can debate what you ought to do about those societies, whether you ought to forcibly intervene or not. But I think it's just fact of the matter that like it's immoral to marry people off at the age of 12 and people who do that are wrong to do so. So that would be that to me is the most sort of compelling case. And I, I understand that it's not necessarily going to be compelling to everyone, but it seems to be the most compelling case for why moral realism is right. Whatever you think about the nature of moral disagreements and things like that, it's that it, it correctly assesses where the actual source of normativity is, which is in the moral foundations themselves, not in our beliefs about them. Mm -hmm. And what about if someone that is a moral relativist says that uh, moral relativism is not really about um, completely abandoning uh, morality, but the, what they say is that it's about moral preferences and that morality is not universal nor objective in any way? I mean, at the end of the day, I would say it seems like there, I, I would point to the moral foundations and say, present to me examples of, you know, like make a case for why these are wrong. And like, um, I, I think that this goes beyond mere preference. I can distinguish between my personal preferences with regard to something and my moral judgments with regard to it. I got, I acknowledge that like, my personal preferences may influence my moral judgments, but if it's the case that we can do something that seems moral to us, even when it is against our personal preferences in that particular case, then it does seem like they are separable. And so it seems like the moral relativist has to make the case that um, we ought to treat people's preferences in some sort of privileged kind of way. And I'm just not at all compelled by that. Like, I fully understand that people who engaged in slavery had a strong preference for engaging in slavery and thought it was moral at the time. I think they were deeply wrong. I, you know, just as wrong as the flat earthers in a sense. Um, so, you know, I do think that these claims are universal. I think it's true of every individual that they ought not to cause unnecessary suffering that like they shouldn't do that. Um, and that, you know, there are situations where they may be forced to do so. And that's, you know, that's why all things being equal, one ought not to do it. But like it does still it is still true for everyone. Nobody gets out of this obligation, I don't think. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me ask you this. The, uh, you, you say that people can be objectively wrong about their moral preferences. But when you say that, are you only referring to when people behave toward other people or also when they make decisions about their own life. So let's say, for example, <laughs> uh -huh. what what do you think about people self harming, committing suicide and things like that? 
Yeah, so this is really complicated. And again, we're dipping back into the normative here a little bit, but I think it's good it's good to do so because we you know we want to flesh out like how far am I willing to go, right? So the big problem for moral realists is a problem of elitism, right? Are you really willing to say this other group of people who are acting differently are objectively wrong in some kind of way or is you know like there's a reason that cultural relativism became very popular, right? It grew out of the um, anthropological tradition because there was a period of time where anthropology was Christian Western white dudes going into native tribes and saying, well, these people are all horrible people because they don't follow Christianity and they don't wear shirts and stuff like that, right? And so anthropologists made a very good argument that like, if you're going to understand other people, you need to set aside those judgments, right, for the sake of understanding them. And that's a really good practice, right? It got a little out of hand, though, I think, and it switched over to this view that, like, we literally can't say of another culture that that culture is more or less immoral than any other culture. And that, to me, is wrong. That's going too far. I do think we can really reasonably say the Nazis were not a good culture in an objective kind of way, and no one should take after them. Right. So um, what does that then mean on a personal level? Right. That's your question is, how do I apply that? And this gets into, um, you know, another moral foundation. The, the one, of them, one of them I mentioned is autonomy. You could rephrase that in the Mills kind of way of like all things being equal. One ought to respect individual liberty. Right. Respect personal freedom. Um, and I do think we should. And I think that like. I think it gets very complicated whether when it is okay to intercede in other people's behavior. So Mill tries to use the argument, if unless they're causing direct harm to someone else, we have no right as a society to intercede, right? We can implore them not to, but we can't forcibly stop them. That distinction is, I think, untenable though, right? There's no... There's very little to no behaviors, as far as I can tell, that really, truly only impact the individual in isolation and don't impact others. In a radically interconnected society, if someone tries to kill themselves and, for example, they can't afford medical care, right, the society ends up fitting the bill of saving them or something like that. So these behaviors do impact other people. Um, on the flip side... You know, we don't want to go all in on paternalism, right? We don't want to say that we're going to, like, get up in everyone's lives and force them to live certain ways because we think that that's the objectively best thing to do. So we accept some amount of loss, some amount of moral harms of some sorts that are caused by allowing people to act freely up to a point. And then at that point, we intercede. And where that point is, is very tricky. So, so for example... I think that we should allow people to end their lives for a variety of reasons. I think euthanasia should be considered morally acceptable. Whether it should be legal is a little bit more tricky. It has to do with problems of harming individuals by putting them in a society where they could plausibly be coerced into killing themselves, especially given the state of our healthcare system and how expensive it is. People are very likely to feel pressure about that, right? So it gets tricky there. But I do think we can, for example, make distinctions between, you know, allowing someone who's 85 and has lived with severe chronic depression their entire lives and just doesn't want to anymore, choosing to end their lives versus someone who's 15 and dealing with some depression, right? But there's not yet reason to think that it's hopeless for them to try to prevent them from killing themselves. So... It's very tricky. Let me, let me give a perfect. Let me give a personal example, right? I'll give a very, very personal example. Um, my wife uh, got sick and almost died about five years ago of cancer, and she was a very pro-natural, don't want chemicals in her body kind of individual. Um, and so she was very unhappy that she was suddenly on chemotherapy. And there were points during that, you know, morphine haze chemo time where she was like, I don't want to do this anymore. I do not want this anymore. I want this to stop now. And, you know, we continued the treatment. And, you know, I talked to her about it, and we talked to the social worker about this, and I said, you know, if that's truly what you want, I, I accept that. And the, the feeling, I think, passed to some extent, and we continued through, and now she's, you know, in remission, and she's happy living her life again. 
and it's you know it's a case of paternalism right i didn't let her have the thing that she wanted in that particular moment and i wrestled with whether that was the right thing to do but i do think that ultimately it was the right thing to do and i hope that she feels that way about it and you know i, I wish ethics would be so much be- so much easier if there was just like you know never be paternalistic or absolute rules about never violating people's autonomy you know like if i could make my moral foundations clearly hierarchical in some kind of way that would be better but i just don't think that that's the way it works and i'm willing to bite the bullet and say it's a mess and we have to find our way through it as best we can but there are facts of the matter that we should pay paying attention to that make our judgments better or worse in various ways mm-hmm. you know i've been thinking uh, thinking a lot recently about these and that's why i asked you i mean how do you apply it at a personal individual level because i mean sometimes it seems to me very um how should i put it uh i I mean let's say let's put it this way we don't have direct access to other people's minds right so absolutely so so so, (laughs) i mean when someone says that she is suffering I mean, when it comes to how we should deal with that person, of course, that there are certain instances where it is plausible for us to doubt, at least to certain to a certain extent, that what that person is saying is really true or not, or to what extent she is really suffering. But I mean, at the end of the day, I guess that it's still the case that. Uh, you can't be sure if that person is not really uh, horrendously suffering uh, at a mental level, at least. Because when it comes to physical harm and physical disease, I mean, it's a little bit he- easier because people sure. can really see what's happening there. In When it comes to mental illness, for example, it's much harder. So, I, I mean, I was just wondering if... Uh, sometimes we shouldn't be a little bit more liberal when it comes to uh, people, to letting people decide or making really harsh decisions about their lives, even when it comes to euthanasia and suicide and things like that. Because, I, Mm -hmm. I mean, I can very easily imagine situations that are really excruciating, uh, I mean, they are really, really painful for the person and uh, it, there isn't any other way for her to more effectively communicate the situation. So, um, Yeah, I absolutely agree. I, I'm a very, I'm, I, I tend toward the liberal side of things because I think that, um, yeah, we should allow people to make to as much as possible to be making their own choices in these kinds of ways. I don't believe in free will, but that's a whole other debate. But like, uh, I think that we should sort of respect autonomy, let's say, right? The quote unquote, ver- whatever version of it that we actually have. Um, there's still value in, in letting people sort of freely live their lives in that kind of way. Um, so yeah, and, and you're totally right that there is again, another level of epistemic problem here with the kinds of things that I've been pointing to as the sources of normativity are very hard to observe directly. You know, I think that I can observe your flourishing, for example. I think that I can tell to some extent when someone is flourishing, but the indications aren't perfect, right? You could be pretending to be flourishing while (laughs) secretly dying inside, right? Um, And this is actually especially a big problem, I think, down the line for conscious AI that like, we're never going to be able to test whether an AI is truly conscious, whether it's truly suffering or something like that. And in situations where we have any good reason to think that it's some, a being is suffering, but we don't, we can't prove it, we probably should give them the benefit of the doubt and imagine that there is something it's like to be that being and that we need to respect that being suffering in that kind of way. So, um, So I guess what I would say is, you know, there, there's a problem with not being able to observe it directly. And I agree with you that the solution is giving individuals the benefit of the doubt wherever possible, essentially. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, yeah, when it comes to AI, now that you brought that uh, topic to the table, I guess mm -hmm. that it would be even harder to assess that that piece of technology experiences, whatever, whatever kind of mental experiences, because uh, I mean, in the case of other animals, at least we have very good sets of behavioral proxies, for example, to know if they are able mm -hmm. or not to have this and that sort of uh, mental experience or mental phenomenon. Uh, and also the fact that because there's biological continuity, we can right. look we can look at their brains and we can find similar structures that operate in similar ways. And then, I mean, we can make the inference that with a very high degree of certainty, they will have the at least similar kinds of mental experiences. But when it comes to um, an, an artificial being, I mean, a silicon being or something like that, then, I mean... Yeah. I guess that all bets are off because yeah. we don't even have access to those kinds of things, right? Yeah. So this, um, I, I totally agree with pretty much everything you're saying here, I think, right? Um, you know, Nagel's famous what it's like to be a bat paper, right? Where I think he convincingly argues that we can know there's something it's like to be a bat, even though we don't know what it's like to be a bat because of, like you're saying, biological consistency, right? They evolved via the same trajectories that we did and so it's reasonable to think that they evolved a similar some some version of internal states of awareness though we cannot know for sure whether they have them just like i can't know for sure whether you have them right or whether the, anyone besides myself has them or even whether i for sure have them though i think i'm pretty confident that i do um but you're also very right that the AI is in a very different position because it doesn't come up via the evolutionary pathways that we came up through. Um, it's We can't just infer that it likely, that, that its behavior is indicative of an internal state of awareness like ours is. And in separate from the behavior, there's nothing else to look at to really prove whether someone is conscious or not. Um, I don't know if you've seen the movie Ex Machina, but they do a really excellent job about this, about like saying there's really there really fundamentally is no way to test for the positive existence of consciousness. Maybe you can prove, maybe, maybe, maybe you can show that certain things don't have consciousness, but I think in that, those situations, it's only going to be things that are of an evolutionary kind of nature similar to our own. Um, so, you know, what's going to happen, I think, is we're going to build AIs that can mimic behavior really, really effectively, increasingly effectively, and they're going to get good enough at it that it's going to be it's going to become very hard for us to doubt that they have internal states and we're going to have no way to confirm it one way or the other and eventually i think we'll have to give them the benefit of the doubt um this raises another interesting problem though too we've been talking mostly about ethics as it applies to conscious creatures but there's a, a really complicated question about does ethics apply to non-conscious entities mm -hmm. could you ever have ethical obligations towards a being that isn't conscious um and i think the answer is yes <laughs> like i think that an ai entity can have interests there's something that it can be like for that for things to go better or worse for that entity and that we can have obligations towards those interests even if that entity is not phenomenally conscious in the way that we are phenomenally conscious um and there are other, there are a couple of other arguments in like environmental ethics for uh, applying ethics to entities that are not phenomenally conscious, like ecosystems. Like you can argue that you have a moral obligation not to collapse an ecosystem, even if doing so wouldn't actually harm any conscious beings, for example. Mm -hmm. So yeah, but, lots but of things. <laughs> when, I mean, <laughs> when it comes to biological beings, let's say. Uh, even if they are not conscious, I, I mean, for us mm -hmm. to decide how we should deal with them, I, is it important that they at least have uh, some other kinds of mental experiences? I mean, it's a bit hard to understand, for example, let's say that an animal was not conscious, but it, right. it processed pain. I mean, but, right. but since it was not conscious, 
Uh, I mean, it wouldn't have any subjective experience of pain, right? So, I mean, right. would, it, would it still be relevant that it was able to experience pain in that case? So I, I would say it's relevant, but it's not necessary, right? It's sufficient, but not necessary for us having a moral obligation to it, right? So take, um, you know, a, a, a giant redwood tree or something like that, right? Let's assume for the sake of argument that redwoods aren't conscious because it wouldn't be adaptive for them to be conscious because they don't move around very much. And there's some good reason to think that, like, phenomenal consciousness only comes into the picture when you are able to interact with your environment in sufficiently complex ways, Right. So is it still objectively immoral for you to come along and for no reason whatsoever cut down a giant redwood tree? Right. And let's assume for the sake of argument that, like, you're not depriving anyone of the enjoyment of looking at that redwood tree. You're not depriving anyone of, like, a home living in that redwood tree or something. Right. It's really just you and the redwood. I think it's still objectively immoral to cut down the redwood tree because... I think there's something it's like for that redwood tree to flourish. And not in an internal sense, but I think like we can speak to the flourishing of that tree growing big and tall in that kind of way, and that depriving it of that, even if there's no it there, right, ending that process of flourishing is to me committing a kind of moral harm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, I mean, we've already <laughs> done almost 90 minutes. We've talked yeah. a lot uh, about a lot of different things. I mean, when it comes to uh, moral realism, and since the premise of the conversation was for you to try to convince me that moral realism... Yeah, have I moved realism, a little? Uh, I mean, I, I, uh, my answer is that I will have to digest what we talked about here before I make a decision. Uh, but I, I mean, is there any other thing that you would say about moral realism that we haven't touched on that you think is important that that might convince someone that it's really a thing? Sure. Let me. I'll give my closing statement here. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. All all philosophical theories have problems, right? And metaethics is no different. Um, I in, in positing moral realism, I am not claiming that there are no problems to be resolved or addressed with regard to moral realism. I'm arguing that it seems to me to be the best way of understanding these problems. So that voting hypothetical, for example, right? I think that's where that 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 question really cleaves reality uh, at the joint. We, we haven't talked at all about the Euthyphro dilemma, but like. I'll, I'll tie that in here at the end, right? So the euthyphro is, you know, are things good because we say they're good or do we say they're good because they are in fact good, right? If that's the fork of the dilemma, if those are my two options, I pick because they are good. Because as weird as that might be, as, you know, queer, quote unquote, as moral properties might seem to certain individuals, I'm willing to bite the bullets on that side much more than I'm willing to bite the bullets on the subjectivist side of things or the anti-realist side of things. Like, I think that their problems are much worse. And that I think that, like, if you adopt a more, the right kind of moral realist perspective, it has significant downstream implications for how you treat morality, how you engage with others, etc. And so I think flawed as the position may be, it's the right one for people to adopt given our set of imperfect options. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So let's end on that note. Uh, I mean, apart from your podcasts, what are the other places on the internet where people can find your work? Uh, they can find me on Twitter. Um, most of my time is spent at ETV pod for embrace the void pod. Um, though I'm also sometimes over on at zero G philosophy. That's the philosophers in space um, Twitter account. And they should all come join our Philosophers in Space Facebook group. I know Facebook is evil, but our group is not. Um, and it's a really great community for debating these kinds of topics. So if they were, if you've spent the past hour and a half wanting to shout at me personally about why I'm wrong about this, you can go to that Philosophers in Space Facebook group and you can post and I will absolutely respond to it compulsively because that is that is my, my lot in life. Um, so please come join us and make sure you answer the security questions or else I will think that you are a bot and I will not allow you access despite all the things I just said. 
Okay, great. So, Aaron, it was really a pleasure to talk to you and to have you on the show. And maybe somewhere in the future we could talk again. And by then, probably I will already have an answer as to if I are, if I believe in moral realism or not. So, okay, good. Yeah, I'll get you over on Embrace the Void, and you can um, tell me if I've convinced you, and we can chat about uh, other things that are of interest to you as well. Hello everybody, thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've been doing regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. So to keep this channel sustainable, I would really like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. Any amount, even just one dollar, would already be a great help. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, you can also support me via Subscribestar or Paypal. And please share the video, leave a like, and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perelga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantel Gelinas, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Brian Rivera, Lucas Stafiniak, Sergio Condriano, Iane Henninen, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, John Connors, Adam Castle, Vega Gidi, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, David Diaz, Anian Kata, Jacob Klinkby, Dr. Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Ruth Gervois, and Bo Weingart, and also my three producers, Isar Webb, Rosie, and Jim Frank. Thank you for all.